Hello and welcome to Sound Strategic. I'm Maya Nowens. In today's episode, we'll look at climate change and its implications for global security and defense. There's been a lot of movement on recognizing and addressing the security threat of climate change in the past several months, from high-level strategic policy attention at NATO and the G7 to ministries of defense in the UK, US, New Zealand, and elsewhere, working to operationalize how defense can manage risks and focus on prevention. This is an indication of how climate change is increasingly regarded as a vital national security interest, and indeed an increasingly important area of consideration for defense establishments. There's a growing consensus that climate change not only means more extreme weather, disasters, and humanitarian crises, but that it will impact the whole span of the strategic environment, from accelerating drivers of conflict in some situations to the transition away from fossil fuels affecting the geopolitics around energy security, and these rapid changes to the physical environment impacting geostrategic competition more broadly. Today's discussion will take stock of where climate change features in national and multinational security concerns and some of the main issues and priorities ahead. To help me discuss the issue of climate change and global security and defense are Brigadier Ben Barry and Shiloh Fetzek. Ben is the WIWS Senior Fellow for Land Warfare based in the WIWS office in London. He analyzes the higher management of defense, military strategy, operations and tactics, military innovation and adaptation in modern warfare and land warfare. He's currently focusing specifically on the implications of climate change for defense establishments. Prior to joining the WIWS, Ben served in the British Army and commanded an armored infantry battalion and a multinational brigade on UN and NATO operations in Bosnia. He was director of the British Army staff in the UK Ministry of Defence and has authored a number of books on the changing character of war, British operations in Bosnia, and most recently authored a book on Afghanistan and Iraq. Shiloh Fetzek is an associate fellow at the IISS and has worked on climate change and security for 14 years at the Royal United Services Institute, the IISS Defence and Military Analysis Program, the Center for Climate and Security in Washington, D.C., and for the UN and World Bank. Shiloh and Ben, welcome onto the show. Thank you, Ma. Thanks so much for having us. So Shiloh, let's start with the bigger picture here. How does climate change impact geopolitics and global security? Broadly speaking, climate change is often understood as a a threat multiplier or a risk multiplier in that the impacts of climate change can act on the drivers of insecurity and instability. So food and water security, disasters, migration and displacement can all interact with poor governance, uh, grievances, social tensions, and so forth to accelerate conflict uh, and instability risk. Climate change can be a factor in conflict onset, but it also is a factor in uh, conflict relapse and trying to stabilize situations that are currently Uh, unstable. So if you look at the whole arc of instability from West Africa into the Middle East into Western Asia, you can see that a lot of the areas that are uh, currently affected by conflict also have considerable climate vulnerabilities. So again, Afghanistan, Yemen, parts of the Sahel, uh, where IS is expanding into Africa, these are places that are really going to struggle in the coming decades to maintain the social compact between governments and citizens and uh, manage tricky issues around natural resource availability. Climate change is not a separate issue or a separate set of threats, but it really is part of the strategic context and it affects many of the security issues that we are currently facing. And it's something that we have reasonably sound information about the future of. So that multiplier framing is quite handy uh, as a threat multiplier or risk multiplier, because there are as well a number of kind of feedback dynamics in the system in that once a situation is unstable, it becomes quite difficult to implement climate adaptation measures. Many of the areas that are currently conflict affected and also climate vulnerable are going to be facing compound challenges. And this is not just a poor country problem. We saw in Australia last year record-breaking wildfires uh, that followed a prolonged and severe drought and were followed by floods that were made worse. So you can see that there are kind of the risk of cascading crises. Climate change isn't just about extreme weather, though. 
Uh, as you mentioned in the intro, it's also about the energy transition away from fossil fuels, the changing value of strategic minerals and strategic mineral supply chains for the renewables industry. And it's clear that these impacts will, will affect the whole of the security spectrum, uh, geostrategic competition, institutions, and the multilateral system. So it's really important to take a, a really broad view of uh, what such a rapid change in such a short amount of time is going to mean for uh, the international system and the security environment. Are governments and multinational institutes just waking up to this reality and these implications, the variety of implications that you've just mentioned, or are we further down the line in terms of our understanding and policy response to this challenge? This has been acknowledged as a security issue for around 15 years, um, but there's been a pretty significant push kind of in the last year, both at the multinational and the national level to integrate climate risk into security policy and planning. So we've seen NATO, the G7, the EU, UN, and others really working to advance um, their positioning on this. So NATO is integrating it into their 2030 strategic planning and have endorsed a climate security action plan to improve their own assessments, their own adaptation and mitigation and you know, outreach on the issue and really make NATO a hub for um, improving the alliance's capabilities in this area. The G7 most recently recognized climate security in the summit communique and have made some uh, pretty significant funding commitments on addressing climate risk. The EU is really working to center climate change within its foreign and security policy, investing in early warning and crisis prevention, uh, including through the, the Climate Change and Defense Roadmap. And at the UN, the Security Council, uh, for the past handful of years, has been working language on climate risk into some of the, uh, its resolutions that recognize climate threat mostly in the Sahel and East Africa, and recognize the need for the Security Council to receive information about the way that climate change is affecting conflict risk in its remit. So um, they're also building a lot of institutional infrastructure to better understand and respond to the risk through a, a climate security mechanism that's at the kind of at the junction of UNEP, UNDP, and the Department for Peace Building and Political Affairs. So that's kind of at the uh, an overview of the multilateral picture. At the national level, uh, the Biden administration is really working to advance this as well. One of the first things he did in office was to issue an executive order on tackling the climate crisis at home and abroad. And we're seeing climate change as really central to the whole of the Biden administration's agenda. And the Department of Defense, for example, is really pivoting hard on, on climate risk. Um, and other countries as well are kind of picking up the issue and, and running with it. So we're beyond the, the waking up stage and moving to the more concrete, preventive, planning, operationalizing uh, responses. And the, the, the signal that we've gotten from this high level strategic guidance is quite strong, um, both on the, on the climate security side and also on the dealing with climate, uh, climate issues at the source. And a, lot, a number of countries have uh, committed to net, net zero target, net zero emission goals targets, although very few have legislated for it at this stage. Ben, Shiloh just mentioned the G7, which was, of course, hosted by uh, the United Kingdom this year. So what actions have you seen in the UK with regards to tackling the climate change and security challenges uh, that were just outlined? And in particular, how does the UK's Ministry of Defence play a role here? In parallel to the political development Shiloh's mentioned, in a number of countries in the West, we've seen a real groundswell of public opinion, and that's been noticed by politicians by business and by military military chiefs. And there's no doubt that activism of a number of uh, world figures has helped with this. In the UK, for example, both Extinction Rebellion and Greta Thunberg, as well as Sir David Atten Attenborough, the popular naturalist, um, have had an evangelizing effect, as indeed has, has Bill Gates. Um, and you've got um, the British Army chief, for example, stating in public that um, young people in the UK seem to be extremely concerned about the climate emergency. And if the values of the armed forces and Ministry of Defence aren't seen to match uh, young people's values, young people won't join the army. 
Uh, so what you've got in the UK is quite a useful alignment of the planets. There's no doubt that uh, many politicians have got the message. In the case of the current government, there is a, quite a lot of personal enthusiasm demonstrated by the prime minister. And the British government has a national um, climate adaptation plan. And as Shiloh said, it's passed quite demanding uh, legislation as well as set up an independent climate committee uh, to hold the government to, government to account. Now, the Ministry of Defence and the Armed Forces produce about half of the British government's uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And over the last year, they've developed a strategy uh, which we've helped them helped them with by running a few conferences for them. And what that strategy seems to do, seeks to do, is to move um, defence, that is the MOD and the armed forces, uh, from being a net emitter to being carbon neutral by 2050. And of all the countries that have done this, it seems to me they've got the uh, most developed uh, plan a particular priority is going to be to reduce emissions from their considerable estates, their army training areas and barracks, their naval bases uh, and their airfields. And, for example, the Royal Air Force has declared an objective to make all their bases carbon neutral uh, by 2030. Um, they're also experimenting. As an example, the Army's got a couple of scout vehicles up and running with hybrid electric drives. Uh, the Royal Air Force has agreed that all aircraft um, in the UK military, which it has the policy lead for, uh, may move towards using hybrid fuels, a mixture of uh, standard fuels and both artificial and um, biofuels. The Royal Navy is uh, seeking to make their ships more environmentally friendly. Indeed, they claim it's their latest uh, mine hunter. Uh, has the lowest methane emissions of any warship anywhere in, anywhere in the world. And also what's quite clear to me is the senior leadership of um, UK Defence is, is, is up for this. Uh, they've appointed an independent uh, executive director to their board for climate change and sustainability. And there's a whole network of senior officers in the central staff, in the logistics, uh, in their infrastructure organisation, and indeed in the three services that are all busy doing this and it's doing this in terms of trying out ideas experimenting and also energizing interest and excitement which is the key to getting progress it's surprising i think perhaps for some of our audience to hear that departments of defense are increasingly active in this space of uh, climate change ben could you maybe talk us through aside from um, th that very important point you, you made of uh, the necessity for armed forces to reflect society could you maybe talk us through some other reasons for why climate change uh, is important for defence to consider? One reason is because they need to make themselves more secure and resilient themselves. There are plenty of uh, airfields and naval bases that are threatened uh, by rising sea levels. And for example, the US Navy has done good work uh, with a community next to one of their naval base bases that's on the East Coast that's greatly uh, threatened by this. Um, the other thing, I think, is they've learned hard lessons about the cost and risk of hydrocarbon fuel dependent logistics from Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, broadly speaking, Iraq and Afghanistan were characterized by huge U.S. logistic convoys that stretched for miles, taking supplies to the bases. Uh, most of what's on those convoys, more than half of it, was fuel. It was for the large numbers of helicopters. It was for aircraft. It was for the huge numbers of generators, computers, air conditioning and surveillance equipment. Now, the statistics clearly shows that on a quarter of all those convoys, a US serviceman was killed or very seriously injured. So if you can reduce the amount of stuff you're moving around, you reduce the threats and you also make yourself more logistically independent. And I'd give credit particularly to the US Marines, who in the later stages of the war in Afghanistan, did a lot of work about making their forward operating bases uh, more self-sufficient, including arrays of solar panels and wind turbines, and also making more use of unmanned helicopters, which, because they don't carry a crew, are more fuel efficient. I think there is a real appetite uh, in the US uh, Marine Corps and the three British services
to not only do better for the environment and for uh, suppressing climate change, but also to make themselves more self-sustainable and resilient. I would add the Navy to that list as well, I, all the services. But I think that there's a particular interest on the U.S. side from the Navy, given not least because of the way that installations are situated uh, on the coast and vulnerable to sea level rise, storms, and so forth. Um, but it's good to have the Marine Corps uh, on board with this too, and they're really doing a lot to advance the, the energy transition within the military. I think there's there's a related factor as well, which relates to uh, the way business is also repositioning itself to shift the ecology of what they sell to reflect net zero. So, for example, if for uh, motor vehicles in Europe, we move from petrol and diesel being the primary fuel uh, to electricity or, say, hydrogen, there'll come a point at which old-fashioned conventional diesel-powered armoured vehicles won't be easily and cheaply sustained by, in by industry. Um, and that uh, armed forces see this and they're de desperate not to be left behind in part because if they become, say, the sole user of old-fashioned diesel in Europe, it'll be much more expensive than it is at the moment. Fascinating. Um, let me ask you both, if there have been previous waves of interest in both the US and the UK, what's different this time with regards to policies and actions being taken? Yeah, there certainly have been various waves over the years, also in Australia and elsewhere. Um, you know, I think a lot of it comes down to the political winds changing over time. I think the kind of initial push on the UK side led by Margaret Beckett and David Miliband when they were foreign ministers who had been uh, environment ministers previously, which um, is, a, is a useful phenomenon to see also with Jens Stoltenberg, current Secretary General of NATO, having been the UN Special Envoy for Climate Change. Um, they were on the UK side really pushing this issue ahead of the Copenhagen Climate Conference in 2009. Um, and the, the, the kind of previous crest of the wave in the US came uh, with the Obama administration at the tail end of which he issued a presidential memorandum on climate change and national security, directing the various US uh, departments and agencies to work in a more coordinated fashion to address this risk nexus. And even after President Trump rescinded that, work continued within the Department of Defense on this. So each kind of push of the wave hasn't receded entirely. It's There's been progress. And this is also true of the, of the G7, the foreign minister's working group on climate fragility that the Germans initiated in 2015 and which ran for a few years, but it kind of ran out of steam. Uh, and I think that there are sort of three key ways in which uh, what we're seeing now is different. The first one is that previously we've been reliant on issue champions. And, you know, there would be somebody within a ministry of foreign affairs or whatever who got the issue and wanted to push it and wanted to devote resources to it. Um, but that wasn't always the case. And that's partly why the the working group on climate fragility uh, got passed around to different G7 presidencies and kind of lost momentum a bit. But I think that this issue is becoming less niche now, and we will be less reliant on those types of issue champions. Uh, second reason why things are different this time around, I think, is that climate change is clearly reshaping the domain. It's happening before our eyes. Degree of the extremes that we're seeing, you know, even for a country like Australia, which has, um, where climate change is a highly controversial policy issue, you know, you can really look out your window and kind of see what the danger is, not just other people over there, but here at home as well. Lastly, I think one reason why this recent push will be more durable is that we're in the process of being shaken by a non-traditional security issue right now that came from nature. We clearly need to be better prepared and more proactive about dealing with what we can see coming down the pike. I'd echo all Shiloh's points. I think I mentioned already that climate change has become a, an issue about which there's a considerable amount of public awareness in the UK, um, particularly in the younger generation. I'd also offer as, as, as a parallel New Zealand. New Zealand um, has done a lot of good work on this. There's a couple of interesting papers on their MOD's websites. And they're particularly struck not just by the environmental factor, uh, which is important to New Zealand's tourist industry when it gets going again, 
but also the security implications in the Southwest Pacific area, an area that, if you like, is New Zealand's near abroad from security, security terms. And there are Pacific uh, island states that are low lying that are seriously challenged by climate change. I think there's also a number of other planets that have, that have lined up. Uh, one is that um, the UK's defence strategy is very interested in exploiting emerging technology, uh, particularly robotic, autonomous and unmanned systems. And the Royal Air Force is openly talking about, say, four manned future fighters, easily be, being accompanied by a, a dozen or so uh, what they call loyal wingmen, fight, fighter drones working in concert. Well, that quite clearly is going to consume less fuel uh, than a dozen or so man, manned aircraft. The same with taking people out of ships and submarines and indeed um, having less people in armoured vehicles, which creates new uh, technical and tactical opportunities, but reduces uh, emissions. There's also been a quiet revolution in simulation. Uh, we see it uh, with massively multiplayer online role playing games. The military equivalents of those have also revolutionized military training. So there's the potential to move a great deal of training that used to happen in the real world and burn lots of hydrocarbons into virtual reality to improve the quality of such real training that, that goes on. I also think that the pandemic has changed people's attitudes, uh, not just to the power of a, 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 a non-state global disruptive threat, but also there's a popular sentiment amongst business, amongst people, amongst trade unions in the UK, uh, that the UK must build back better. And part of building back better is building back greener. And what we've also got is industry, uh, both defence industry and industry that sits on the boundary between defence and civilian sector uh, that's got the message and wants to sell greener technologies. An example of this is airliners, where Airbus, who's one of the major global um, manufacturers, unveiled a strategy just before the pandemic to actually develop three prototype much greener airliners. And that, for example, is directly relevant to air transports and also multi-engine aircraft like maritime patrol aircraft. The planets have aligned now, from my point of view, in a way they weren't necessarily aligned 15 years ago. Are current policies enough? It sounds like we're on the right track. Um, or should we assume that more can be done? I'm, I'm going to assume that the latter is the case. But if so, what specifically would you point to? There are difficult issues with this. Lots of, uh, lots of people, for example, in UK and New Zealand and European countries, would welcome the armed forces uh, making a contribution to net zero, but they don't want to reduce the fighting, the fighting capability and you might recall that during the Iraq war, for example, the British government came in for a lot of criticism of not providing adequate equipment to the, to the troops. That requires uh, an open attitude and it also requires strong communications and leading what could be a difficult change. But I think the problem can be overcome. For example, although it's going to be difficult to uh, green a heavy, a 70 tonne heavy tank burning a lot of diesel, you could achieve similar effects from lighter armoured vehicles that had electric electric propulsion. And I know of work that's going on in at least one army to look at to look at that option. I think also armed forces need to start from a foundation. They need to actually do their own audit and set up their own database and make it transparent through the armed forces and particularly to decision makers so they can see where the quick wins are, where the priorities are and what's, what's going to be difficult. And so they have to take their own people with them, and they also have to take the public and public and polit politicians. And if there's one thing I think that needs to be there needs to be more of done, it's probably internal and external communications. So people in the armed forces understand uh, why they're such important climate actors, uh, both in a negative sense and potentially in a pos in a positive sense. And if countries like the UK and New Zealand can take the lead, lead on this, uh, they can help crystallise uh, change throughout militaries, militaries in the world. I'd also say that if the work that um, Secretary Austin has commissioned in the Pentagon, if this comes to fruition and starts changing attitudes in the US armed forces and US defence industry, 
Now, that's going to be difficult, but if it happens, it will have an energizing effect because of the uh, global influence of the US armed forces and particularly uh, the global dominance of their defense industry. They really echo Ben's points on communicating where this issue is at and the benefits of acting on it uh, and the role that uh, best practices sharing and, uh, you know, even intelligence sharing uh, can be an alliance strengthener. It can be a basis for partnership building and it can really put us onto a much stronger footing. I think in general, what we're seeing now is the high level strategic uh, recognition of the issue, but there's a lot remains to be done in order to operationalize that and implement it. Um, and I think that there are kind of a handful of things uh, in general that governments and, and institutions need to do uh, in order to be on a better footing with this, to improve risk assessments and situational awareness and leverage the expertise that countries have domestically on climate science and on security studies, and to really develop uh, really thorough risk management and uh, conflict prevention action plans that look to the near-term needs and the medium-term needs that, that improve rapid response capabilities and build uh, resilience to some of these dynamics. And really to uh, do what Secretary Austin and others, New Zealand, UK and others are doing to uh, strengthen that institutional infrastructure and capacity around this issue. And a lot of that really involves more cross-sectoral cross-sector, working and uh, you know, looking at this as a nexus issue that really requires a lot of relationships and coordination between uh, different parts of government and people with uh, different roles and remits. Shala, you mentioned that um, sharing good practices can be an alliance strengthener and useful for partnership building. But of course, progress on climate change will also require countries to work with um, adversaries or systemic rivals, uh, depending on where you stand, such as China. How does that play in here? It's clearly the case that there's going to need to be an element of cooperation in some aspects of the European, U.S., Western relationship on, with China on achieving carbon reduction goals, greenhouse gas reduction goals, uh, given that they are now the world's largest emitter. Um, but that's going to take place alongside competition in the Arctic, uh, U.S.-China competition for strategic alliances and partnerships in the Pacific and elsewhere. It's going to be a balancing act that will need to be struck between maintaining both of those relationships at the same time, but they don't, they certainly don't uh, cancel each other out. And I think uh, it's just important to take a broad view uh, on long-term mutual interests, work to those where you can, um, and understand how the changes that climate change will bring are going to influence geostrategic competition. Uh, and China is well aware of this and has been, you know, perhaps behind closed doors uh, looking at their vulnerabilities and how these changes play into their strategic interests going forward. Their strategic competitors really need to have the same level of analysis around how these changes will affect the strategic environment. If I were to ask both of you what you each think are the main challenges that you foresee moving forward to achieve greater progress on this topic, what would they be? I think that maintaining momentum on this issue, maintaining the political will to address it by committing the level of resources that are needed in order to uh, maintain to have a preventive stance is probably the biggest risk. There's a clear argument for the benefits of that in that it's a lot cheaper to avoid a conflict than it is to, to deal with its aftermath. But I also think that that argument may not resonate uh, as it should necessarily. And I I'm very concerned actually around about how this issue intersects with some of the divisions uh, within society and um, the eroding consensus on a common good that uh, we are seeing develop. And I'm quite concerned about how this issue might be interpreted or what kind of narratives might emerge around it. As climate impacts really start to bite, it might be harder to make the argument that it's worth investing in 
uh, prevention and climate resilience overseas when the level of domestic emergency uh, and need is also going to grow considerably. And I, I think that there will also be some, again, kind of disagreements around this reflected around, for example, whose security is being best protected. Uh, what do we mean by climate security? And I think that this could put some strains that are already kind of emerging and visible within the multilateral system, could it put additional stress on those at a time when that system is needed in order to uh, respond to this. So I really emphasize uh, what Ben said about the need to communicate about this well. I agree with Shiloh 100%, and I won't repeat anything she, she says. There is a great danger if global warming ac accelerates, and we've had a, a nasty foretaste of that in the northwest US and uh, Vancouver recently. And you could see major uh, heat waves having calamitous effects. We also don't know enough about the potential tipping points where you get self-reinforcing positive feedbacks that just ac accelerate uh, the negative effects of climate change. If that happens, it'll, it'll be very diverting. For example, there'll be increasing use of European militaries within Europe to deal with the climate emergencies, and they'll have less spare capacity to help with humanitarian and disaster relief operations responding to climate emergencies overseas. I also wouldn't underestimate the extent to which uh, climate change could lead to radicalised violent extremism, not just existing violent extremism, insurgencies, terrorism and politically motivated organised crime. But under some circumstances, you could see climate motivated insurgency and terrorism in its, in its own right. So this makes it really important for countries to look at these, these risks honestly, but get ahead of the curve with a national plan, both a national climate adaptation and then their defence and military climate adaptation. So I think you've both given us uh, some food for thought already uh, on a wide number of issues. But if there's one thing that you'd want our audience to walk away with after listening to today's podcast and your insights, what would that be? Truly, the time is now for prevention. Again, highlighting what Ben just mentioned about the risk of cascading impacts. The climate science tells us a couple of things. One, that we're likely to see a lot of surprises in the system and that where we are at, it's questionable whether we can achieve the targets set out in the Paris Climate Agreement. And if we do not, there's a serious risk of runaway climate change. This is not just a poor country problem. Um, and it's really important that we take a broad, comprehensive hard-nosed, science-informed look at the risks and act accordingly. From a military point of view, military history is full of examples of armed forces that have failed to prepare for the future sufficiently and have paid the price. It's also full of less examples, but good examples of armed forces that have seen the challenge coming and adapted for it. Think of the German panzer divisions developed before the Second World War. Uh, think also of the U.S. Navy and U.S. Marine Corps' development of amphibious operations. This is a similar such challenge, and Armed Forces and Ministry of Defence need to wake up, see it as such, and start experimenting, innovating and adapting so that they continue to do what Armed Forces are good at doing at in a climate-changed world. Well, thank you both for this insightful conversation. I've certainly learned a lot, and I don't know whether to walk away slightly more optimistic than I was at the start or uh, slightly more concerned uh, than I was at the start with all the work that's still left to be done on this. I hope to have you both back onto the podcast again soon to talk about this more. Thanks, Mara. It's been a pleasure. Look forward to it. Thanks so much. And thank you all for listening. We hope you enjoyed the episode. Please do follow, rate, and subscribe to Sound Strategic wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts to keep up to date with all the latest episodes. And for more in-depth analysis of the key international security and defense issues from around the world, be sure to follow the IISS on Twitter, LinkedIn, or visit the IISS website. Thank you and see you next time.